Hello, and welcome to the Spinach ICOM NatHist 2020 virtual conference. If you're joining us via Zoom, please say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining from so we know that you can hear us. All right, we have at least a few participants, so that's great. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, we're also live streaming via YouTube and we will be including the link in the chat. If you have any colleagues that weren't able to register or for some reason they're kicked out, please feel free to share the link to the YouTube channel on your social media and they can connect that way. Uh, lastly, this session is being recorded for later viewing. So before we begin the plenary session, we have some remarks from Barbara Tears, the president of the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections, or Spinach, and Dorit Wallenitz, the president of International Committee for Museums and Collections of Natural History of the International Council of Museums, or ICOM Nat Hist. Barbara. Hello. As president of Spinach, I'd like to welcome you to the Spinach ICOM Nat Hist 2020 virtual conference. The last statistics I have is indicate that we have more than 1,700 registrants for this meeting. When we first began discussing the possibility of a virtual meeting several months ago, none of us ever imagined such a wonderful response. And I want to give my wholehearted thanks to the organizing committee who have worked extremely hard to make this a reality. And the work continues. All day long yesterday, our Slack channel chronicled the putting out of one little conference fire after another, and I imagine Slack will be just as busy today. Our team is spread across the world, so many of them are not getting much sleep, at least not at regular times. The committee consisted of uh, Andy Bentley, Emily Bracker, Mariana Di Giacomo, Phaedra Wong, Shelley James, Talia Kareem, Amanda Lawrence, Paul Meyer, Rebecca Newberry, Cindy Opitz, Deborah Paul, Rita Zimkus, and Leah Appleton, our webmaster. Thank you, a wholehearted thank you to all of them. We're excited for this conference to begin and at least to be together virtually for a little while this week. But before we begin, I, I want to take a minute to acknowledge that this meeting is being held <clears throat> at a time of great plan, pain for black and brown people in my country because of the systematic, system, systemic racism that has plagued our country since the beginning and has found its most recent expression in the brutal killing by police of George Floyd, who's being laid to rest today. I hope that the protests and conversations sparked by this tragedy will indeed lead to elimination of disparities in government, science, education, and health. Last night, Spinach Council voted to amplify this message and extend it to people all around the world who are facing racial oppression. We have not yet issued an official statement on the matter uh, and in, for Spinach, and we're still exploring the steps we will take to make our organization more diverse and inclusive, but we'll be talking about this more at the annual business meeting. I hope you enjoy the conference, and if you aren't a member, that you'll consider joining our organization. Given the difficult economic times, we did not want to require membership for attendance, but dues are the lifeblood of Spinach, and without them, we cannot support our publication programs or the grants and fellowships that we award for emerging professionals in our field. So please join, and if you have ideas about forming regional spinach groups that might meet separately in person or remotely, be sure to let us know so that we can support you in that effort. Expanding international participation has long been a goal of the organization. I also hope that everyone will be kind and patient with those who are new to online participatory events and to the organizers who have to improvise many times because of technology issues and to those who are trying to manage family life at home while they participate. Now over to Dorit. Technically. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or maybe good night too. Um, I'm Dorit Wallenitz uh, from Israel, and I'm uh, currently the president of um, ICOM NatHist, which is the organization for the uh, Natural History Museums and Collections. ICOM NatHist is one of the international committees of the International Council of Museums operating under the roof of UNESCO. People from natural history museums and similar organizations can join us and are invited to do so. Today, I feel like a proud parent whose uh, child has finally been born. We started um, about a year ago to organize a joint conference with Spinach 
scheduled to take place this week in Edinburgh, Scotland. But then the pandemic, pandemic came and changed our lives. The conference in Scotland was cancelled and our Spanish colleagues decided to try to go for a virtual conference. We did, uh, we did not hesitate for a moment and joined them for the adventure. The organizing committee met on a weekly basis and held vigorous correspondence to bring the conference to happen. I want to thank our colleagues from Spinach for the hard work in preparing the conference and also for my colleagues from the board of ICOM Natist, who gave a hand in the organizing of the conference. It's amazing how we gathered over a thousand participants from all over the world it wasn't easy to plan a conference time slots given the time differences in between the uh, regions around the world. I know that museums have gone through a difficult period. In many countries around the world, museums are closed to visitors. Some of the workers were sent on an unpaid vacation and some were laid off. And yet, we needed to take care about the uh, collections and uh, safeguard them. Today, we are at the beginning of a new period of preparing for the return of, to, to activity. And uh, we have chosen to dedicate the plenary session to present presentations on museums and the COVID-19. I wish us all a fascinating and interesting week. Hopefully meeting you all face to face soon. Thank you and have a nice uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorit. If you don't mind um, hiding your video, I just have some housekeeping. Um, so welcome, this is the plenary session entitled Reopening Collections, and I'm your moderator, Brita Zimkis, from the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. I'm being assisted by my MCZ colleague, Jessica Cundiff, who has been my co-chair of the Best Practices Committee for the past five years, um, and we wanted to be involved in this session because we knew it would yield important information as we reopen our collections to both staff and visitors. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to all the speakers in the session who agreed to give presentations on rather short notice. Our first three presenters will have 15 minutes each and the last two presenters will have 10 minutes each. Um, any questions that we do have will be saved for the plenary panel discussion at the end. We'll, with which will be the last 25 minutes or so. Those of you be, uh, joining us via Zoom can ask questions of the speakers using the Q&A feature, which should be found at the bottom of your screen. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or conversing with your colleagues and the other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat fun function being disabled for all. To pre prevent uh, unwanted guests on Zoom, please do not share the Zoom links with others, but again, you are welcome to direct colleagues to our YouTube channel. Please bear with any technical difficulties that we may have, um, which includes uh, interruptions by pets or children, <laughs> and we hope that you enjoy the session. Our first speaker is Elizabeth Merritt, who is the Vice President of Strategic Foresight and Founding Director of the Center for the Future of Museums at the American Alliance of museums. She will be speaking about the post-pandemic future of museums. Please give me a moment to welcome Elizabeth. You know, we don't have any sound. I'm calling yours. No sound. Apologies, let me start over. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear I'm the Elizabeth video? Elizabeth Merritt, Vice President for Strategic Foresight and Founding Director of the Center for the Future of Museums at the American Alliance of Museums. I'm really happy to join you today to share a few observations about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the financial status of museums and research collections, and share some thoughts about what museums might be doing to respond in coming years. 
First of all, I know Barbara Tears is going to be sharing some detailed data from a research survey that was done of biological collections later, so I'm not going to reference that study at all. But I would like to mention some data that we've seen from ICOM UNESCO and from AAM itself. Basically, it seemed like at the height of the pandemic, globally about 90% of museums were closed, and ICOM estimates that 13% may never reopen. Here in the U.S., Essentially, all museums have been closed at some point in the past couple of months, and we have reason to believe that up to a third could be at risk of permanent closure. In part, we know this due to the work that we've done in the past couple of years to prepare for a publication we released in March, which was our annual trends report that this year looked at the future of financial sustainability. And I've given you a bitly link here where you could download the report. It's free to any kind of member of the Alliance, institutional or individual, and it's available to non-members for $10. And what we do in that report is we do a deep deconstruction of the traditional sources of income for museums and discuss how we see museums improving those income streams currently and what might happen in the future. In looking at the old state of affairs pre-pandemic, this is a snapshot of how natural history museums got their income. You can see it's pretty um, cleanly divided between 42% earned income, 28% contributed and donated, 9% draw on the endowment, and 22% federal, state, or local government funding. But all of those sources of income uh, are taking a hit now, just as they did in 2008 during the mortgage loan crisis, except worse. So we're seeing that, that now more than ever, natural history museums and collections have to rethink how they're making their money. Actually, since 2016, AAM has been partnering with the Ecological Society of America and the Yale Peabody Museum with funding from NSF to look at how museums might build income streams around research collections to make them more financially resilient. In that study, we basically concluded that all of the innovative things that you can do to earn income, for the most part, help mostly by building awareness of the fact that museums have collections and that those research collections are important and valuable, not a minor point, but it's rare that museums actually build sufficient income streams to provide significant support. I've got a bitly link here to a recording of a webinar we did about that project if you'd like to look it up. So what are the current impacts we're seeing? There's been an almost complete loss of earned income as museums close, both from the gate, from the ancillary sources of income, such as the store or food service. People are cancel have canceled events. In most cases, they're not legally allowed to resume them yet. Um, foundations are trying to keep up their support. A large number of foundations have uh, signed a pledge to convert their conditional gifts with for programmatic um, outcomes to general operating support to try and give museums the need, the flexibility they need to repurpose those funds to help stay open. Uh, we were already seeing a trend away from a lot of small individual gifts and towards a few bigger gifts from ultra wealthy individuals. And the question is now, how will those ultra wealthy individuals be wanted to give their money? There's some indications they're pivoting to being more concerned about pandemic response. And now in the face of the recent um, social unrest, with people demanding that we confront um, systemic racism and police violence, a lot of them are also doubling down on social justice causes that may cause some funders to pivot away from uh, arts and culture and potentially research. <coughs> Government funding is going to be hard hit, just as it was in 2008, as the tax base collapses, both due to high and continued high unemployment and due to um, a reduction in tax property tax revenue. And then endowments, the market is fluctuating right now, uh, but we're seeing many museums beginning to spend down some of their financial reserves to attempt to maintain their staff. So they may have lower endowments when all of this um, begins to recover on which to draw for a proportion of their operating income. So far, how are we seeing museums respond? First of all, they're trying to reduce their largest costs, which unfortunately is staff. So we are seeing museums doing furloughs, doing layoffs, in some cases taking pay cuts either across the board or in some cases directors and leadership stepping up to take disproportionately large pay cuts. Um, in some cases, they've been able to postpone that uh, by getting payroll protection loans. Uh, 
that may or may not be able to maintain staff over a year or more of closures, depending on what the institution is, uh, or the possibility of recurring closures that I'll touch on later. We're seeing museums pivot to digital with a lot of great public engagement, educational resources, um, social media diversions, and also repurposing staff who used to be front of house to work behind the scenes on doing annotation and improving records keeping. But the problem with that pivot to digital is even when it's really popular with the public, it very rarely has an income stream attached to it. So it's not helping much with um, maintaining the museum financially. And lastly, we are seeing some museums dipping into financial reserves, but there are limits to what they can do with that. Quite often, large portions of endowments have legal restrictions that can't be easily set aside. And even if they're not legally restricted, if they've only been voluntarily restricted by the Board of Trustees, they may not be particularly liquid. There may not be an easy way to access them quickly to try and um, meet payroll or pay the rent or other urgent expenses. As museums begin to reopen, we're worried about a number of things. First of all, as museums begin to reopen um, in states like Florida and Texas that have led the way, usually there are restrictions on attendance. So there still may be restrictions that a museum can only have 25 or 50 percent of its uh, maximum I assume, fire rated capacity. So that puts limits on how much um, a museum can earn. And also there are still often restrictions on the size of public gatherings. So they may not be able to do the sorts of large rentals or fundraising events that were bringing in significant income in the past. We also are testing the willingness of the public to return at all. While there are some indications, um, you can look at the, the information from Impact's research that Colleen Dillon Schneider is publishing on her blog, Know Your Own Bone, that shows that there's a strong intent on the part of the public to return. The fact is we won't know until we actually reopen how safe people feel. Susie Wilkenning of Wilkenning Research has been doing some uh, intensive Q&A with focus groups that shows it really varies. I mean, people are probably going to feel better about coming back to open air venues like sculpture parks or aquaria, I'm sorry, or zoos or botanical gardens, but they're still pretty hesitant about going into small enclosed spaces. Um, so even once we're reopened, people may or may not be flocking back in terms of public attendance. We definitely are gonna have increased costs from equipment and supplies and staffing for sanitation. And at the same time, we're faced with a possible loss of workforce from volunteers who are either unwilling or unable to return, or the museum may not be willing to accept the liability of volunteers, many of whom are older, uh, coming back into the workplace. Many university-based museums may not have work-study students, uh, and may not have the students who often are doing projects and work in the museum. We're also faced with the prospect that museums may not only have to gear up and pay for reopening once, we may have to do so repeatedly because a lot of the projections about COVID are that it isn't going to be a one and done. We're going to ease restrictions, we'll see a recurrence, there will be shutting downs locally again, so as we track the numbers there may be a need for local businesses to open and reclose and open and reclose. For museums, that means um, repeated expenses of trying to figure out how to shut down and reopen. So what are some of the long-term risks? I'm really worried that museums and parent organizations, so, such as state museums, municipal museums, or museums and college and universities are a particular risk. We're already seeing that those such organizations are having their own acute problems and are beginning to pass them along to the museums that live inside their structures. The city of High Point in North Carolina is already proposing to close the High Point Museum because that would save them about half a million dollars on a 7.2 million shortfall. We have a lot of college and universities debating about whether or not to hold in-person classes next fall at all. The California State University system has said it won't. Others have said that they'll have a hybrid model of some in-person classes and some virtual, but we see students pushing back and saying, why should I pay a full tuition if I'm not getting the full college experience? So if colleges aren't able to really fully reopen the campus and they're facing their own financial stress, they may be questioning whether they can support museums and collections uh, at full normal costs when they're having their own uh, income crisis. Longer term, 
frankly, higher education was already having destabilizing issues. For example, a, a shrinking number of students who are going to be entering um, the cadre of students and increasing awareness of the problems of student debt with people making trade-offs on whether or not it was worth taking on that debt to get a college degree. Long term, this crisis could accelerate the number of small and medium term, medium sized institutions of higher education that close permanently. Here's some what ifs I want to throw out for your consideration. Um, oh, actually, first of all, I want to touch on the fact we're also worried that there could be a reset of museum financial models. So it's not like that when COVID eases and we reopen, everything's going to go back to that original balance I showed you of earned and contributed revenue. There could be long term resets of how and where we can earn money or get money from um, philanthropy or from government institutions. So it's going to mean reinventing financial models instead of reestablishing the old normal. Okay, so here are some questions of what if that I'd like to throw out to you. First of all, what if many museums do close? So that horrible worst case scenario we threw out of a third of museums in the US closing, what would that mean? It's terrible, but would it mean that there is more money left from other sources to distribute to the resulting museums? Um, or as I'll touch on in a moment, um, will it mean that they pass on some of their financial obligations to others? What if this crisis impels museums to finally figure out how to monetize digital content effectively? That might be a phenomenal income stream that could help underwrite traditional areas of service, such as collections, care, and research. On the other hand, what if museums, as they struggle to reinvent their financial models and reopen, seek to reduce their staff long term? Is that going to mean it's going to be even harder to retain staff who are back of the house and not attached to active income streams, such as collections care staff or researchers. On the other hand, what if we're facing double digit unemployment for two years? Let's say the government actually steps up and miraculously provides a universal basic income, which many people are discussing. Would that increase the volunteer labor force? Is that something that museums could draw on to try and maintain service behind the scenes while they're short on staff? I think we really need to start thinking about damage control now. One of the things I'm worried about is identifying at-risk collections, collections that either might be orphaned if museums close or might be at risk because the collections are shuttered and they're not being adequately monitored. I think we might be talking about joint mechanisms to rehome collections to institutions that could take over their care from institutions that are unable to maintain them. And I wonder if we need to create some sort of national cadre of volunteer collections care staff to step in to make sure that none of these vulnerable research collections are falling through the gaps. And I'd like to close by pointing out that in the long term, I think the best financial model for biological research collections is that they're essential infrastructure and they, they need and deserve government funding just the way that roads and schools and other basic infrastructure uh, design, uh, are deserving of funding. That's not the situation in the US right now. It's not an accepted thing. So I think that we have to work very hard as a field to create quantifiable ties between our research collections and public health to the basic scientific resilience of the country and our ability to respond to crises like this. And I'd like to finish by pointing out that AAN has been uh, working as hard as we can to compile resources and information that might be useful to museums in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and planning how to survive closures and how to reopen when we're able to. So I hope that you look up those resources there at www.aam-us.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Elizabeth. Um, if you can give us a moment to pull up the next presenter, um, we have Samantha Snell, who is a collections management spe specialist and price chair at the Smithsonian National Collections Program. The title of her talk is The Collections Emergency Management in the COVID-19 Era. And I am going to ask, um, at Samantha um, show her video. Give me one moment.
Okay, you're welcome to start, Samantha, although I don't see your video. Um, I can see myself now on the screen. Um, can anyone else see me and hear me? Yes, you're good, Sam. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk with you all today about the Smithsonian's price team and our collections emergency management efforts. Uh, this pan-institutional team advises and provides subject matter expertise, consultation, and assistance to the National Collections Program, NCP, and Smithsonian Collecting Units, and Smithsonian Senior Management, and when activated, provides collections support, response, and recovery as requested by NCP as part of the Smithsonian's Emergency Operations Center, EOC. We are here to support unit activities with the resources and expertise that they request. We will not show up and take over a scene. Collecting unit staff know their collections, space, and needs best. Next slide. Before I talk more about price, uh, here are a few quick facts about the Smithsonian. Hopefully you have all had the chance to visit at least one of our 19 museums, nine research centers, or zoological park. Next slide. We deal with some very large numbers here when it comes to our collections. Um, after over 170 years of collecting, we are now the caretakers of over 155 million objects and specimens, ranging in size from parasites to the Concorde aircraft. We hold these items in trust for the American people, and these items represent our cultural heritage, spanning from the depths of the ocean to the outer reaches of space. Next slide. So the price team. Next slide. The PRICE program launched in October 2016 as a response to several events, a few of which include the Garber Building 21 collapse in 2010, the Natural History Cooling Tower fire and Mineral Virginia earthquake in 2011, and Superstorm Sandy in 2012. PRICE was created as a complement to unit collections emergency response teams and other central offices that have various roles during emergencies. This includes the Office of Safety, Health, and Environmental Management, Office of Protection Services, the Risk Management Office, Smithsonian Facilities, and the Office of Emergency Management. Next slide. Each PRICE team member is a co-lead for one of the action teams. We call them action teams because we're all about action and getting things done for our colleagues and community. Next slide. These talented professionals devote their time and energy not only to their full um, collecting unit responsibilities, but also to supporting the Central Collections Emergency Response Team. Uh, we, of the three teams, we'll start with the Logistics Action Team, which has three main goals at this time. The first one is to create a library of statements of work, SOWs, that can be used as templates for similar orders. The second is working on identifying emergency carts around the institution, not just to identify that we have the carts, but the contents thereof. And our third goal is to help identify spaces, equipment, and supplies that can be shared across units in the event of an emergency. This can include the emergency supplies, the carts, for example, but also equipment and vehicles. Next slide. The policy and procedures action team goals are largely to help develop guidance to assist the various Smithsonian units in the event of a disaster. We want to work on things like templating of various forms and disaster plans, we have been working primarily on an SI-wide unit survey dealing with the level of preparedness across the units in terms of disaster plans and awareness of roles and responsibilities therein. We wanted to know how aware folks are of the incident command system and how connected they are with their operations section chief, for example, or their planning section chief within their unit. Next slide. The training action team works on developing curriculum for collections emergency trainings, utilizing expertise from a variety of professions around the SI. Each year, we host the May Day Wet Salvage Workshop, where participants learn how to respond to water emergencies. The past two years, we've also hosted the Holy Smokes Fire Recovery Workshop in conjunction with the National Institute for Standards and Technology and the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives Agency. In this workshop, participants learn how to recover collection items from staged burn rooms, 
outfitted as mock collection storage spaces. In each of these workshops, we invite SI colleagues from across the Smithsonian, collections, conservation, registration, security, facilities, emergency management, exhibits, and more. These workshops are great opportunities to learn more about colleagues across the SI and across departments, especially when it relates to teamwork during collections emergencies. We also collaborate often with our PSTers or price support team members, led by Lisa Palmer and Megan Toner from the Natural History Museum. Anyone who has completed a price workshop is considered a member of our price support team. Even before enhanced telework, the training action team has been working on developing rentable training modules or a sort of lending library that can be checked out and hosted at the different collecting units. One recently released training is about different roles and responsibilities during collections emergencies. So far, members of Price and our PS tiers have hosted this workshop over 10 times in the past couple months. So even while we're social distancing, Price is able to provide training for all Smithsonian staff on a variety of topics. Next slide. During this period of enhanced telework, the TET has been working on several training opportunities that can be hosted and accessed virtually, as well as in person. By the end of June, we plan to launch two more telework compatible trainings on emergency documentation and fire salvage. Next slide. So what do we prepare for? A little bit of everything, all manner of natural, technological, and man-made hazards. Also, having most of our facilities located within a stone's throw of the nation's capital and housing some of the most iconic American cultural items put us high on the threat scale. So unfortunately, those are additional factors we need to consider when thinking about our spaces. Next slide. Despite all of these known and perceived threats, one of the challenges that Price had when we began was that some people felt that emergencies, incidents, disasters will never happen here. We're the Smithsonian for goodness sake. We're protected from all ills by a magic invisible bubble. Unfortunately, this is not the case. But as Price has focused on outreach and training over the last three and a half years, the awareness and support for preparedness and risk assessments across the institution has grown exponentially. We know that the programmatic activities of the Smithsonian involve an exposure of collections to risk of possible damage or loss, as Rob Waller of Protect Heritage Canada shows us with this formula for defining risks. This illustration is always useful and now can be utilized as a reminder that the risks associated with each of the agents of deterioration are heightened when put into the context of response during a pandemic. Next slide. Risk to staff and collections are compounded during this time, regardless of the scale of the emergency event. Though we consider all the agents of deterioration, water is still our most frequent issue. Pre-COVID-19, most water incidents did not require the activation of the Smithsonian or unit emergency operations centers, but were handled by a few staff members within the affected unit. This method of response is being reevaluated now when considering the health risk factor of the virus. There have been numerous studies on the waterborne transmission of viruses, and at this time, articles are being published related to the waterborne transmission of COVID-19, particularly in wastewater. So this is something to be aware of during a water response. Next slide. Pre-pandemic, the Smithsonian EOC had been activated only for the planning and implementation of activities for known or scheduled large-scale events, presidential inaugurations, the 2017 Women's March, 4th of July, and the Washington Capitol's Stanley Cup Parade. But with the Smithsonian operating under emergency status since mid-March due to the COVID-19 pandemic, a virtual version of the EOC has been active. This EOC is comprised of a diverse group of staff with specialties from across the Smithsonian, including collections, security, risk management, health and safety, facilities, information technology, communication, among many others. This collaboration has never been more important than right now. Our partners in OEM focus on personal and facility safety. Within their emergency operation plans, which cover things from active shooter to hurricanes, Price has added collections components. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. Partnering with other departments and developing holistic plans and procedures is essential to supporting the goal of one Smithsonian during standard and emergency times. The National Collections Program, which Price is a program under, is emergency support functions for within the Smithsonian EOC. 
In the event of an emergency, the NCP director or price chair who sits at the table would contact, consult, or activate price to respond to and provide support to an affected unit. Next slide. So what is price doing and related to COVID-19? We're focused on communication with our internal and external partners. The price team meets weekly. Oh, next slide. The price team works weekly um, and meets weekly to share information as a team. And we meet with our collections emergency points of contact, POCs, as a group for monthly meetings. These POCs are representatives from all of the collecting units. These meetings have been a positive platform for comparing challenges and successes and learning with each other virtually during these time. Training continues for all staff during this time and we're always open to suggestions for future trainings. We created a central location for sharing resources, a Teams group for collections emergency POCs to provide resources, webinars, and a platform to share information such as unit level collections care activities on site during enhanced telework. Uh, we also work with central offices regarding things like food inspections for the cafes, the gift shops, the mobile carts, um, preventative maintenance, uh, making sure that water is getting poured down drains so that we don't have drain flies coming up, checking dishwashers to make sure that there are no leaks. Next slide. So Price re received many questions from staff, especially during the early days of the pandemic. And so we collaborated with the National Collections Program and the Museum Conservation Institute staff to respond to those questions. And those responses became a frequently asked questions document that has since been added to the internal Smithsonian COVID-19 site. And just to point out a couple things um, on this site that we have answered for our community, including you know, how to disinfect spaces um, without harming collections. And we work very closely with our facility staff consulting with them about what types of materials to use and where and how to disperse those materials. And also we've provided recommendations on how to respond to large and small scale emergencies during this time. Next slide. We have been updating the internal price SharePoint site, which is accessible to all Smithsonian staff. Through this platform, we're sharing resources and weekly emergency operations group call reports. So all staff have access to the information that we're receiving as part of that ESF4 seat at the table for the EOC. Next slide. A collections emergency POC's team site has been created for disseminating information among those members. We also share some of these resources with the central SI reopening and new normal teams, particularly those resources that relate to collections care and concerns that are being raised within our own and external cultural heritage communities webinars, articles, plans from other institutions that highlight our areas of concern are shared with those teams because they have the issues and challenges of all aspects of reopening and considerations from security to health and safety of staff, researchers and visitors to technical support for additional virtual offerings to collections handling procedures. So we try to highlight and focus in on specific topics and information that could be helpful to them as it relates to our part of that puzzle. Next slide. This slide shows two examples of broader Smithsonian participation in being part of positive activities related to the pandemic. Um, the Realm project that Scott Miller is gonna talk about briefly later is highlighted here to emphasize that the Smithsonian is proud to be doing our part to help guide the nation's libraries as well as ourselves in terms of circulatable handling materials. Next slide. Um, and just a few quick thoughts to wrap up the presentation. Um, when thinking about responding to emergencies during this time, one of the most important things to remember is don't rush in. Take your time to communicate, plan, and ensure that all of your health and safety procedures are in place, including having the appropriate PPE for the situation you're responding to. Keep in touch with your facilities, security, and health and safety folks. They may be able to take you on virtual tours of the spaces they're patrolling. Let them know what you're concerned about and perhaps you can Zoom or FaceTime with them to see the spaces of collection items on exhibit that you're concerned about. Keep the lines of communication open with colleagues throughout the cultural heritage community. We learn from each other each day and especially now it is extremely beneficial to hear what others are doing so that we can share out lessons learned. Protecting collections and those working with collections requires a collaborative approach with various experts, including those with safety, health, security, and building management backgrounds. 
and joint training exercises and virtual exercises offer a great opportunity to bring professionals from varied backgrounds together to learn from each other and problem solve collaboratively, even virtually during these times. Thank you all so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Tom Strang. Um, Tom, if you've started your video. Um, he is representing the Canadian Conservation Institute COVID-19 Task Force, and will be speaking about caring for heritage collections during the COVID-19 pandemic with the focus on reopening. I'd like to acknowledge the other members of this group who contrib contributed to this work, including Irene Karsten, Janet Kepkowitz, Simon mm -hmm. Lambert, and Crystal Matland. And shouldn't be muted. And and hello. Please just give me a moment to pull up the slides. Sorry for the delay, Tom, you're welcome to start. And just a reminder, uh, we have the Q&A, we'll be uh, asking questions using that if you would like to put your questions in throughout. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So is the audio clear now? <clears throat> so um, heritage collections are coping with many challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, while the virus doesn't directly attack the collections, the pandemic certainly complicates their care. And I'm sharing some of the information and recommendations compiled by the Canadian Conservation Institute uh, COVID-19 Task Force to help those responsible for collect with collections. So um, we address collections, questions about collections contamination, disinfection of museum spaces, managing collections care as institutions reopen. And CCI has written a note based on these questions that we are sharing on the internet and an updated version to offer more guidance on reopening should be online by the end of this month. So uh, dealing with the COVID-19 crisis still leaves us all with uncertainty and at CCI we recognize that knowledge about COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve, which may require us to adapt some recommendations going forward. Next slide. Public health agencies agree that the primary mode of transmission driving the pandemic is recognized as an airborne path with viruses expelled by sneezing, coughing, and speaking. And according to the World Health Organization, people can become infected by touching contaminated surfaces and transferring to their eyes, noses, or mouth. And a major aspect of the public health advice is focused on limiting these pathways to lower the rate of infection. So when considering objects in collections, virus deactivation outside the body and infrequent handling of objects lowers risk of transmission. More frequent interaction elevates the risk for surface transmission. Next slide, please. Part of our internal process was to review and collate primary literature on human coronavirus properties. And we discussed how they might impact collection care decisions. We tracked public health developments and references to guidelines being developed elsewhere. To date, there are two papers characterizing stability of SARS-CoV-2, which has caused the COVID-19 pandemic, and it's demonstrated similarity to SARS in response to the environment is useful, as there's also a body of work to inform us on trends not yet elaborated for SARS-CoV-2. This plot incorporates room temperature stability data for human coronaviruses classified by test type. The rose tint squares highlight the COVID-19 virus information. Suspensions are the black circles modeling liquid storage and transport samples that have the longest stability. Coupon tests, blue dots, look at the ability to stay infectious when dried on commonly hospital surfaces and fomites. And the aerosol test, green boxes, look at the dynamics of virulence in airborne liquid particles. As outlier data for SARS, not for COVID, 
two papers reported very low activity on plastics at six to nine days and two weeks in specific test situations, such as mixed with protein or even dry air conditioned environment. So this tells us there's a little bit of a ragged right hand side. Next slide, please. The papers by Vandari Malin et al. 2020 and Chin et al. 2020 provide the only data on this COVID uh, virus stability to date. This table provides a summary of the endpoints, which are quoted for safety in news articles and woven into public health guidance. CCI is not a health organization, but we look at the primary data to help decision making within a collections care context. Museums arguably have the world's most diverse material holdings. An early question to us was, would collections need disinfection? <clears throat> and there are very stable viruses out there, but SARS-CoV-2 is not one of them. This means we could advise people not to concern themselves as much with bulk disinfection, but simply close the door for a week or more. Most of us have been forced to do that by shelter at home compliance. With two papers to compare, one can see that a higher initial titer translates to longer duration on the surface. And when statistical models incorporate the sample variances and interval censoring, examining safer confidence interval edge of the distribution increases the times. So mapping these few materials to a variety of museum collections requires caution. An example, cardboard could be wet strength enhanced. How does that shift the cardboard number? Is it more like plastic? There's no prediction model behind the numbers and you're making inferences if you try, but this is the situation we are all faced with. And this is why we chose for now to put a wrapper around the demonstrated extent, no less than a week, much in the way that WHO decision to encapsulate the onset distribution into the two week rule and the CDC posted a guidance for reusing N95 masks, put Monday's mask in a paper bag marked Monday, wear it next Monday and not before. Next slide, please. So studies on COVID-19 and similar coronaviruses indicate the environmental conditions such as temperature, relative humidity, pH, and UV radiation affect their stability on surfaces. And what we know from available research may not reflect all conditions found in cultural heritage facilities. An example of this was the limited data on virus persistence on dry coupons at low temperature. There's none yet for COVID-19 virus and I certainly hope it's forthcoming. In Canada from March to early May, we had cold conditions for a large fraction of seasonal museums as well as cool storage systems. From surrogate virus and SARS work, cool conditions four to six degrees centigrade, prolonged virus stability in suspensions and on coupons. The values for COVID cited in the table above were obtained between 21 and 23 degrees centigrade. So we certainly have to advise greater caution with cool spaces. Low relative humidity, 20 to 30% is common in heated museums that are not humidified in winter. And there's evidence this can prolong virulence for other coronaviruses. Dusts raised in dry conditions can be problematic as it re aerosolizes attached viruses. And UV and ozone are two deteriorating agents which museums have guarded against because they're cumulative harm to dyes and other organic materials. However, both of these agents do reduce virus stability. Next slide. Disinfecting collection objects or heritage materials is not generally recommended as the alcohols, bleach, and other chemical constituents can damage many of the surfaces and materials in heritage collections. Appropriate use might be 70% ethanol wiped on a frequently touched metal sculpture. However, inappropriate use can cause permanent damage or fail to disinfect properly. So consult professional conservators before doing treatments, please. Instead, we recommend object quarantine if there's a risk of transfer of viruses from objects to people. Identify the issue, erect a barrier, or close the door and come back later. If this is not possible, such as for necessary handling, your tools are temporary enclosure of the object, correct use of personal protective equipment with safe practices and doffing garments and hand washing. Next slide, please. Given public anxieties and the possible resurgence of the virus, establishing a good cleaning and disinfecting protocol is prudent, even if the closure has made its persistence unlikely. It will be a good time to practice prior to reopening, Seasonally operated facilities will have a good idea of what will be necessary from their past reopening procedures. Follow public health guidelines for cleaning public spaces. If the building has been closed for some time with no interior inspections, plan extra time for reopening to do thorough inspections and cleaning, as well as any repairs. Continue floor cleaning, collection spaces, augmented around workstations. 
select the touch point, disinfectant for door handles, switches, cabinet latches, rails, etc., and deploy foot pumped hand stations, disinfection stations, if you can get them. Next slide, please. The highest risk of transmission is considered to be person to person transfer. So facilities managers will need to rebalance indoor environmental control targets that benefit collections with those becoming necessary to safeguard public health. In some cases, common preventive conservation practices are good for both collections and the public during the pandemic. Moderate relative humidity between 40 and 60% reduces the risks of many collection materials, slightly shortens virus persistence, and supports healthy human lung function. Positive pressure that reduces infiltration of pollutants into collection areas protects from more likely sources in public and office spaces. MERV-13 filtration and higher can reduce the concentration of airborne viral particles from circulated building air as well as dusts. Professional, professional associations like BASHRAE organization, which develop standards for internal environment in North America, have suggested increasing outdoor air intake as much as the HVAC system can accommodate during occupied hours to reduce internally generated airborne infection risk. Higher exchange rates may decrease stability and elevate running costs as would the recommendation to flush with maximum outside airflow two hours before and after occupation. Where HVAC is not present, open windows have been recommended to increase ventilation, but expect increased dust and pollutant levels depending on the outdoor air quality. Consider any security risk this opens you up to and display cases and storage cabinets will buffer against some of the problematic consequences. Next slide, please. Collections care may not return to pre-pandemic normal on reopening. Museums will need to follow public health guidelines to keep museums safe for staff, your volunteers and visitors alike. Reopening should reduce many of the concerns for collections that were subjected to extended closure. But collection workspaces remain at risk if contamination by the virus, by contamination from the virus, as long as the risk of community spread is present. Review your collection work arrangements to reduce the need to disinfect surfaces near collections, respecting the need for social or spatial distancing and ventilation for, for preserving human health. Require use of non-medical masks in collection spaces when people are working to reduce the chance of person-to-person -person transmission, as well as onto artifacts and storage furniture. Position workstations to limit potential for contamination assign workstations to individuals so that any COVID-19 diagnosis can be associated with the limited area and remediated. Limit handling of specimens by multiple people by assigning collection work projects to individuals. Next slide. First, follow public health guidelines for people in close contact <clears throat> with the infected person or shared workspaces. Follow up with disinfection, again, avoid disinfection of heritage surfaces, which can be harmed by the process. Close off the area used by infected persons, allow 24 hours for aerosols to settle and then clean and disinfect wearing PPE if you need to get the area back. Cleaning removes dirt as well as any microbial loads on the surfaces and this makes disinfecting more effective. Wear PPE to protect from the disinfectant, gloves, goggles, etc. The virus persists longer on plastic and metal surfaces, which also provide highest transfer potential to skin in contact. However, these surfaces optimize the efficacy of the disinfectants. Formulations and application methods, such as wet spray, wiping, and achieving the required contact time have to be appropriate for the surface. So test first and guard against overspray or dripping onto collection items or other surfaces you need to protect. Leave no harmful residues of cleaning agents and disinfectants. Follow any in rinsing instructions, such as the clean water wipe down after the required contact time, and use the simplest effective solution. Next slide. <clears throat> there are many commercial disinfectants that can be used on non-heritage surfaces. First check if it's been approved for use against COVID-19 virus in Canada. You can find the list on the Health Canada website and in the United States, disinfectants are regulated by the EPA. Follow manufacturer's guidelines for use and after the required contact time, rinse as instructed. Product labels may indicate some incompatible surfaces. Next slide, please. 
So this has been a short precy of the upcoming note, but in summary, protect people first and be prepared to close if there's a resurgence in community transmission. Use isolation to deal with contamination of collections, knowing the virus deactivates in a varied manner. On reopening, increase ventilation and manage work to limit person-to-person -person transmission and surface transmission. In disinfecting, use well-controlled methods and restrict application to non-heritage surfaces to avoid collection harm. Next slide, please. CCI has prepared a note, re um, revised note now, uh, containing elements presented here, plus more details on these and other topics, which should be posted uh, this month. The current note can be found in both English and French on the CCI website at the links on this slide. And a webinar of the currently available note can be found at the Facebook address shown. Give people a second to screen cap that if they want. Okay, next slide, please. I would very much like to acknowledge my colleagues in the COVID-19 Task Force at the Canadian Conservation Institute and contributors for bringing their breadth of experience, their dedication to a common purpose and buoyant good humor to a challenging task. Um, they've had to ingest a flood of information and reweave our workaday paradigms, despite the acknowledged strain this period in history is generating for us all. Next slide, please. The situation continues to evolve. CCI is here to work with you to figure out how to best keep collections safe over the upcoming months. We're very grateful to Spinach and the ICOM Nat His groups for inviting CCI to participate in this plenary session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, as a reminder, we have our Q&A. It is open, but we will be uh, asking all those questions during our discussion session at the end. Um, so I, if you would, Tom, um, hide your video and I would ask uh, Barbara Tears to um, share her video. One You're moment. Well, slides, right? You're doing yes. the slides? Yeah. I am. Give me one moment to pull them up. So next we have Barbara Tears, who is the Vice President for Science Administration and the Patricia Holmgren Director of the William and Linda Steer Herbarium at the New York Botanical Gardens. She will be discussing COVID-19 impacts on biodiversity science collections, a preliminary look. Thank you, Brita. Um, so this is a very preliminary look um, at a, a, a project, of, an attempt to, to survey the uh, U.S. Biological, biodiversity collections to determine the effects of COVID-19 closures on them. Um, next slide, please. This was an activity of the Biodiversity Collections Network, or BCON, uh, which is which we collaborated as well with AIBS, which is the American Institute of Biological Sciences, the Natural Science Collection Alliance, and Spinach. Um, and what we what we wanted to do as soon as the closures became widespread was to survey the community to find out what the initial impacts were. Uh, we the survey was conducted during basically during the month of April. In truth. We thought this might be the end of it. You know, early on, it seemed as if maybe we'd all be back at work in, in April and that this would just be a little look, uh, just a, a way of capturing what happened during that month. Of course, now we know this is a much bigger issue and um, will be going on for a lot longer. Um, however, I will tell you just a little bit about what we learned from that, keeping in mind it's a very early look. Uh, the, the survey results, you can see the, the link down below. If you simply Google um, AIBS BCON, B-C-O-N, you can find all of this easily. Next slide, please. If you go to our site, you can see all of the survey results are available for you to look at. What you see in the top of this page 
are, it's, it's not the easiest way to read, but it shows all of the questions and all of the responses. This, as you can see, it scrolls far to the right. It shows 10 questions at a time, and we had 393 respondents. So you can look through all of them. The software also provides a, sur a summary below of the responses um, per question, how many respondents in each category. So that's an easy way to, um, to get an overall sense. And again, this, these results are available for anyone to, to look at and analyze in any way they'd like. Next slide. Since this is, was just the beginning and, and we were um, at the very early stages of the, the pandemic closure, there's hard to take away any very definitive um, uh, results from the survey, but we did, we, I've summarized a few here. 95, 96% of collections were unavailable for use. So essentially all biodiversity collections in the US were unavailable for use during April. Um, less than, uh, some were being monitored, um, but less than 30% were being monitored for pests, um, which of course are a significant threat to collections and maybe less so in April when it was cooler, this is more of an issue as time goes on. Um, more than 90% of the respondents were working from home. And interestingly, um, most of them were working on some aspect of, uh, of work of projects that result from the digitization of specimens. Um, many were doing data cleaning, some who had access to images were actually transcribing data. Uh, but one of the bright spots is, that I've heard from people is that they had attention, the chance to get put some attention into these data cleaning tasks that always seem to, to get pushed to the bottom of the to do list. When asked about the chief concerns uh, rising from a one to three month closure, um, uh, uh, the most, uh, you know, the, the largest percentage were, were worried about being able to provide the research resources that their, that their users need, needed. Um, about half were worried about the loss of, uh, of funding for collection cares and supplies that might ensue. Um, they were also uh, almost half were concerned about their the loss of their ability to provide public outreach for the public, and you know also a strong amount of concern about the loss of um, staff uh, long term because of budget cuts. I suspect that number would be quite a bit higher now, and finally about their ability to meet um, existing grants and contract deadlines. Next slide, please. So in analyzing this survey, uh, we, we found a couple of things. First of all, it's only a preliminary look and we definitely need to monitor, to, to check in with the community uh, over the course of this and beyond probably. So as a beginning, it was fine, but it was a little unsatisfying. Um, we're now trying to mount a couple of new surveys. Um, and, and in this type, we're, um, we're wanting more specific information about reopening, plans to reopen, and also staff furloughs and reductions in force. So we have two new surveys that are also on the BCOM website posted here. Um, the link, again, you can Google it, you will find it easily. Next slide. And um, here we're asking to, to get specific information about layoffs and furloughs in museums and then a separate survey that talks about reopening plans. I wanna point out that we are asking for official information only. We're not asking for people to share information about their museum that's not public. Information about layoffs and furloughs and even reopening may be sensitive. We really just want this to be a clearinghouse of publicly available information, not rumor or, um, or information that is sensitive, that the institution con considers sensitive. And uh, again, we are, uh, I kind of forgot what the closing date of this, maybe it's ongoing, we probably don't have a closing date, but we'll be building a compendia of, of information about, uh, on these two topics. Um, 
in the back, we, we limited this to the US, um, partly because we were sort of hoping that the results we got would be a great justification for additional funding for US collections from the National Science Foundation. Um, we, we have no reason to think that such collection will be forthcoming at this time, but we felt it was extremely important to document as best we could the national impact of this closure on the work that we do and the people that we are. Um, next slide, please. There's also another reason for doing this, which has, which occurred to me um, based on experience at my institution, the New York Botanical Garden Herbarium. And that is the importance of just documenting for our own sakes, for our own collections, what, what they've gone through and how collections have been handled in different times of stress. Uh, and, and I use this example. So um, a brilliant colleague of mine, Amy Weiss, collections manager, found out that during World War II, the type specimens of the New York Botanical Garden, um, which are number uh, well over 100,000, were packaged up and taken to the University, uh, of, to West Virginia University, and they were stored there in the basement. Uh, and that actually, although not one person on the staff, even going back to our most senior uh, staff members had had the slightest recollection of this or had, had had any knowledge passed down to them about this. Indeed, when we consulted the photographic record, the, our archives, and even, for heaven's sakes, a plaque on the building um, in West Virginia about sheltering the specimens, that indeed this did happen. And um, we were just struck by this, this bit of knowledge which, um, which could have been very useful to us in a variety of situations that we, we simply did not know. And, and in an institution that's been pretty careful, I think, over time about recording its history. Um, it's, it, we have no idea whether or not our types were segregated before this time or if, if this is what resulted in that. If that's the case, if indeed before our, our types were dispersed throughout the collection and then they hurried up to pull them together to take them away, it really could explain an awful lot about what a poor job of the original type segregation was. But now we know this knowledge. And it turns out in Amy's additional sleuthing that many collections moved around to different places during the war and none of the people knew about it until this happened. So not only do we want to document what happens to collections for our national and international interest, but also I think it's a very important part of uh, documenting your own institutional and collection history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, next, I'd like to invite our last speaker, Scott Miller, who is the Deputy Undersecretary Under in the Office of the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian Institution. His talk is entitled Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums, Realm, Information Hub, a COVID-19 Research Project. <clears throat> uh, Barbara, if you don't mind um, sorry, yes, hiding indeed. your video, and I will pull up the slides. Give me one moment. So while we're bringing up the slides, I think uh, probably most folks on this conference are thinking about one of the questions that Tom Strang raised, which is how do you handle materials that might have the COVID virus on them, whether those are um, exhibit surfaces or whether those are collections objects. And so this realm project that is reopening archives, libraries, and museums was created uh, to try to answer some of those questions. This is a very preliminary progress report and um, unfortunately in terms of this meeting there will be some major results uh, released in the next week but, um, but those are not available for release today so you'll have to check back with the, with the website or the email group list. This project is organized by <coughs> the U.S. Government's Institute of Museum and Library Services, uh, OCLC, which is a very large uh, library services consortium in the United States, and Battelle, who is a, um, among other things, a biodefense contractor in the U.S., so they're used to working with nasty microbes. And this uh, study basically deals in, in sort of three major products. If we can go to the first slide, or the next slide, 
Uh, one of these uh, activities is to collect, review, summarize authoritative research on materials commonly found in the collections and facilities of archives, libraries, and museums. By authoritative research, we generally mean peer-reviewed studies, but given the dynamic nature of a lot of the studies that are currently coming out, um, this also includes uh, preprints and, and, and other studies. So there is a preliminary literature review that was done by Battelle that is online now, um, and it has a certain amount of synthesis um, by professionals who, um, who know the topics. There is a more detailed literature review and synthesis uh, by Battelle, which will hopefully be released this week. Um, I've, I've been one of the reviewers for that document, and I will say the, the preliminary literature review has most of the information content has not that much changed in between the two. Um, the, you know, these literature reviews are a very useful summary of what we know. Um, but it is also really striking what we do not know about this specific virus. So just two comments, you know, this very often cited uh, sort of three day time for quarantine uh, of surfaces uh, actually comes from only one paper by NIH, which was not really designed to test that particular um, thing. So um, the tests done by this project will be interesting in, um, in expanding on that. And of course, many of the recommendations that are out there in the public health community are based on assumptions based on the behavior of other coronaviruses. Next slide, please. So the core of this project is really testing in Battelle's BSL-3 laboratories of how uh, live COVID-19 virus interact with materials commonly found in archives, libraries, and museums with an eye towards uh, methods for handling and remediation. The protocol for these tests is online at the Realm site. Um, and basically, um, the COVID-19 virus is applied to um, pieces, small pieces of the materials being tested. Those are sampled uh, at certain intervals, including um, one hour after the virus is applied. So there's a, a validation that there's viable virus on the, on the samples before they're tested. And these tests are being done uh, basically at ambient conditions of 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 40% and relative humidity. Um, the initial tests, which have been done and are currently getting finalized in quality control and should be released this week, um, really focused on materials that are common in public libraries and that circulate. So there's a lot of pressure in the public library community on how to um, deal with them. Um, so that's a hardbound uh, book cover, a paperback book cover, uh, book pages inside of a closed book, uh, plastic protective book cover, and a plastic DVD case. Um, based on the, the, there will be, well, there's, there's another 10 tests that are uh, scheduled to start soon. Uh, some of the aspects of the protocol, the time, timing may be changed depending on the outcome of these first five tests, and there is, will hopefully be a number of more tests, but that is funding dependent. Um, the, we have a long list already that's been submitted by a, a lot of partners of material that, uh, that could be tested, and the choice of materials tested will be sort of an iterative process depending on, on the, the test as it goes along. I will note that because of the methodologies involved, this is just testing the presence of measurable viable virus after the particular time period. It is not dealing with the question of how many virus particles are needed to cause infections in humans. We go to the next slide, please. Um, so the ultimate goal, of course, is to take the results of what I just mentioned and synthesize recommendations 
uh, that can actually be used by museums, libraries, and, and archives in reopening and in their ongoing operations. That will be an iterative process that will unfold over the, the next uh, period of months uh, as both the data and the experience uh, grows. So um, here again on the slide is the website. There is an email list that you can sign up for for updates, as well as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and the, and the usual social media. So um, we look forward to being able to share more interesting results in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. So at this point, I'd like to invite all of our speakers back and we will have our plenary panel um, and we will be answering questions that have been submitted uh, using the Q&A. So if you do have questions, please submit them via the Q&A and we will um, address them. So we have everyone back. Okay. Um, so Deb Paul says, it is rare, thank goodness, in life to be living in a pivotal moment and to be aware that it is a pivotal moment. But the awareness part is at least in some ways a tremendous gift. Continuing with the insights from Dr. Merritt's talk, what are the opportunities here when thinking about reimagining, redesigning museums? Who do they serve? What do they offer? Who do they partner with? How do they connect the virtual and in-person worlds? And I'll open it for whomever would like to, to answer. Well, first, can I drop in and note that I am not a doctor. I don't want to have CV inflation on a, on a webinar. Um, but briefly, my comment would be that, um, yeah, any, any broken system is an opportunity to reinvent it. But the question is, what values are going to guide the reinvention? Um, I've had a number of directors comment to me that having to disrupt their org charts and their staff gives them a chance to rethink from the ground up what their staffing is going to be. Different people are going to have different opinions about what that reinvent should look like. My concern is that right now one of the driving forces is going to be money. You know, where can museums get money from? And that isn't necessarily in alignment with the values of where we would like to steer our operations. So how do we bring the opportunity to be more mission driven and to rethink who we serve how do we bring it into alignment with actually being able to get the funds to support that work? I, I would just say that in, a, in addition to everything else, there's never been a time when, when we need more to, to extract information from collections about for the biodiversity crisis that we're facing. And, if, if there's a, you know, if, if there's a refocusing on what's really important for, for doing that, then maybe, maybe that's something positive that could come. However, I think most museums are pretty much oriented that way already. Um, so uh, I think that we may see the opportunity to expand the way that digital specimens are used. People probably won't be traveling to, to, to visit collections the way they did, perhaps we will really knuckle down and think more about how to share data more effectively to a broader range of audiences. Um, if, if there's uh, ways that, that we can still share data to the public freely and to the scientific community, but perhaps find ways that we can offer products uh, derived from our data, analyses of our data, that can uh, that we could monetize, that we could actually sell to people. And maybe this is a new way of collaboration. Hardly any museum by itself has all the specimens that are needed to address an, a, a question, but maybe there could be a way to form consortia to uh, to actually share data, but but in a way that that could you know bring us some financial returns. Okay, hey, our next question from David Shorthouse. Elizabeth and other panelists, can you please elaborate on what monetizing digital assets or services might be or entail? And I should add that Dirk Newman um, notes that uh, monetizing collections and digital information on collections object is in the center of the discussion to expand the Nagoya protocol. Um, I'm not sure if monetizing digital assets is such a good approach in this context. Well, first of all, let me say when I was talking about museums monetizing digital, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, collections related digital assets. I'm talking digital more broadly. 
and and I would say there are generally two approaches if you're looking at museum digital writ large. And one of it that is just increasing your reach, the number of people who know about you and value your work, and then either using that as a way to solicit contributions. More and more giving is digital um, and driven by uh, people's social networks. So like Giving Tuesday on Twitter is yielding an increasing amount of money for museums. So when a museum like the National Cowboy Museum gets 300,000 followers because uh, Tim, the security guard, was knocking it out of the park doing Twitter during COVID, they can turn that into a form of support. Um, the other thing is sponsorship. So when a museum like the Field Museum of Natural History has a YouTube channel, the Brain Scope, that has half a million followers and whose um, videos have had over 29 million views, when you have a channel like that, you have the potential to begin saying, can we monetize it through sponsorship, through people who want to be associated with our brand? And then some museums are beginning to actually go to a subscription model. So we've seen a ton of really popular content online from, for example, zoos during the crisis, most of which is free. But the Oakland Zoo, for example, in addition to some free content, has created a subscription channel and said, um, if you really love this stuff, help support us by subscribing to this channel that has subscription only content. So those are ways that museums can try and start connecting their reach through digital to people willing to provide support. Okay, um, Deb Paul notes that we need to recognize that COVID-19, the COVID-19 illness caused by SARS-CoV-2 is also a terrible gift to museums but it makes the point that collections, specimens, tissues, they have the expertise to help understand host pathogen relationships through time and space. We need a seat at the table in long-term relationships with communities who study these associations, virologists, mammologists, disease ecologists, medicine. How do we move forward to make sure these relative stakeholders know we have these resources? How do we ensure that public government and policymakers recognize this um, to make, to give us uh, long-term funding. <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> this is Sam. Um, just to, uh, my opinion is being involved in opportunities like we are today. We're coming together at, during this conference from all different walks of life, from all different perspectives and learning to see these different topics through each other's lenses. And I think having those conversations and continuing to reach out into various communities um, can benefit us all as we gather information and keep raising awareness about our concerns from a cultural heritage perspective with our partners out there in some of the groups that we may not think that we're associated with. Um, and we've had some of those experiences with, you know, when we're working with the Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives Agency. It's not something that we would think of normally with cultural heritage, but their fire lab has been a great resource for us, as has the National Institute for Standards and Technology. So I think building the bridges with different communities and groups through conferences like this, through getting involved in different committees and organizations um, can really help to start to plant those seeds that can grow into much more positive relationships down the road. I agree. I think a lot of it is just about networking and getting out there, um, but also an attitude of making materials available and being opening, open to using samples in novel ways and, and extracting information content out of samples that they weren't uh, sort of collected for in the, in the first place. Um, and we've seen a lot of examples of, of that, and we will continue to see them, especially now that we have high quality frozen uh, biological materials in a lot of these collections. And in the course of going through the reviews, kept coming across references to One Health, looking at human mammalian and other animal interactions. So this is a, uh, an idea to sort of bind together the fact that we share a planet and that the problem in this case is uh, you know, originating from an animal populations that are also under stress. And, uh, and this kind of event can stress those organizations and, and the, the, the animal populations we're trying to protect now, which are pushed up against extinction events. So, so it, you know, it's a, it's a teaching moment, as they say. It's a, certainly a time to, to uh, share, you know, STM uh, kinds of career um, 
influences and so you know you push across all the messages we've been working on so we have a question from youtube specifically for samantha um, from emily magnani are any of your modules or trainings available to other museums outside of the smithsonian institution we are working on that right now uh, we currently don't have anything that's available outside um, Personally, I've been a little protective of the information that we've been gathering because we are pretty new. You know, we haven't even had our fourth birthday yet. So we're still um, working and learning and trying to gather information um, for ourselves. And um, our priority is, you know, taking care of our Smithsonian collections community and making sure we have our house in order. So we don't want to push anything out to the broader community until we've had a chance to test it within ourselves. Um, but we are starting to populate the ncp.si.edu website with a little bit more information about our emergency activities. So as we start to roll more information out, that's where it will be posted. But we hope to be able to share more out soon. But I appreciate your interest. Zuria Butler um, asks, what sanitation routines can you recommend for public collections such as non-living biological artifacts that are regularly handled in education programs? Um, just to say, I think we need to rethink our education programs because um, certainly for the immediate future, one, I think the visitorship is going to not be nearly as high as anyone anticipates from what we're hearing um, from our colleagues across the pond and you know in Germany and things like that that we've heard different reports and webinars on is that the, the visitorship is very low so um, handling of collections should not be a priority even for education collections um, as folks are returning even if they are in small numbers um, but maybe to rethink how handleable education collections are dealt with is something we can do now while it's not going to be happening for quite some time. I think people's, the public's comfort level for handling and handing off items between people is going to be compromised for quite a bit of time to come. Um, but I think this is our opportunity to think creatively about how we can re, how we can deliver the same experience or a similar experience for education collections going forward into the future um, that's different from what we did in the past because it's behind us. The past is what we did before. Not that everything has to go on the shelf and collect dust forever, but I think we need to re-envision it um, going forward. Adrian Dewsbury asks, do you think future guidelines will require masks and collection spaces at all times, not just when dealing with specific collections? I know for Harvard, we're reopening this week. Um, we are being required when we're in our um, collection spaces, office, shared office spaces to be wearing our masks at all times. So um, I, I think it's definitely um, probably an institution by institution issue, but um, at least for us, we are gonna be required to. The Smithsonian is the same. Uh, face coverings are required anytime um, any staff are on site at this time. Um, since we don't have our crystal balls working at this time, we can't see how far into the future this practice is going to need to continue. But it's currently our practice and there's discussions about once we start reopening to the public, what is that going to look like and what are those requirements going to be and how can those requirements be enforced? which I think is one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people are discussing within our community. May not be a question, more of a comment. Um, Jessa Waters says, I know that many or most museums in China began reopening in April, so they theoretically already have data on how it has been going in the last month or more. Are folks collaborating, sharing info with colleagues in China to see how it has been going regarding personnel restrictions, public restrooms, disinfecting? Dorit? Uh, we recently reopened. 
Uh, the workers need to wear masks whenever they are staying at the uh, workplace. And when it's also for the public, they can enter the museum uh, wearing masks. We need to take the temperature when entering and also they sign a, a paper that they are feeling good and they haven't been in contact with any uh, uh, sick person in the last 24 hours. And also they um, need to sanitize their hands and we are allowed to have only one person when uh, to, to seven square meters of the exhibition space. So uh, the visitor number is limited. And uh, we open for uh, two hour slots. And to each slot, people can uh, pre-register. And the one that didn't register, they are not allowed to go into the museum. And we have a lot of presentation to do, it's crazy. We have schools coming already. And uh, after, um, uh, after each class, we need to sanitize almost everything. It's crazy. It's a lot of work. Um, another more of a comment than a question, Laura Briscoe says it would also be great for institutions to use this opportunity of potentially high staff turnover to really invest in decolonization of collections and commit to diverse hires. And a number of people are agreeing on that. For sure. Um, that should be, a, it's a great goal. I, I guess to me, it's a little optimistic that we're going to be replacing those people who are let go. Um, I fear what, it's, what we're really going to see is a massive reduction in staff, but we can hope, we can hope that, it, and, and maybe, maybe it will, in some cases, this will be temporary and there will be a chance to rethink the entire structure of uh, you know, collections management throughout the institution. But I fear what we're going to see at first is reduction without replacement. If I can just make a, a pitch endorsing that in the long term, I'm hoping that one thing this helps museums do is rethink the qualifications that have in many cases narrowed the pipeline of people, uh, of the diversity of people who are hired into positions that have traditionally been mostly white. Now that they're closed, some museums are um, retraining and purposing staff temporarily who were frontline staff and were more frequently people of color to do behind the scenes work, including um, online digital work with collections. Uh, one of the reasons I made a point of pointing out that I am not a PhD is I think quite often in museums there's an assumption that people have to have a certain level of academic training that is another barrier to hiring um, to tr traditionally more diverse um, people who haven't had who have had an economic barrier or a cultural barrier to getting that training. So I hope that we we actually double down on thinking about what skills and experience people really need to fill those positions if they reopen and also think more about how we can provide on the job training so we can hire bright, intelligent people and then give them the advanced training they need. I think somewhat related to that, we have um, a question. Many collection care staff have been furloughed and collections haven't been immediately harmed, but how do we encourage the people re reworking their org charts that collection care people are integral to keeping our organizations going? Well, with our, out our collections, we don't have museums, we don't have research centers, you know, so those daily caretakers, those collections managers and techs and staff are essential to care for those collections that so many rely on for their research, for education, for outreach and for celebrating our history together, our cultural heritage. So, um, you know, supporting the positions for those collections care staff members is essential because, you know, and I, I go back and I've, I've told that to many people that, you know, again, without the collections, who are we? And that's why, you know, at the Smithsonian, we try to encourage everyone to acknowledge that they're all collection stewards, regardless of their title, their department, what their specialty is, you know, our security officers are collection stewards because they play a role in protecting our collections and ensuring that we can go into work every day and, and feel like we can be there safely, you know, and the same thing for our safety and health folks. They're, we're all collection stewards and I think it starts with our collections managers and technicians and, and goes out from there for the care and stewardship.
Trina Roberts says, an important part of our usual operations is that we need to figure out how to reopen regarding loans between institutions. This is part of why research collections exist. Separate from the risk of possible virus transmission via objects, we are concerned about increased risk to the objects themselves due to disruptions to packing and mailing services. The current high volume of packages and untrained staff and the possibility of new closures either at our institution or at the receiving institution, interrupting re receipt. Do your institutions plan new restrictions or procedures for the loans as you reopen? It's a really good point. I guess I hadn't actually thought that much about the, the additional risk that you might be loaning specimens to a place that really isn't prepared to give them the kind of care that we expect or to handle them the way we expect. That's a serious concern and I imagine it can probably only be helped on an individual basis. But however, we, we know that loans often are made for many years, um, you know, and uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Actually, that's the next meeting I have after this meeting this morning is our loans forum is meeting to discuss this very topic. Um, so within the Smithsonian, the loans officers at the different collecting units get together periodically to talk and discuss challenges and, and successes at the different units. And um, a, a lot of them have been talking individually on one on one basis about how each unit is going forward and what concerns they are um, that they have. So we're going to get together to start talking about that. But some of the things I've been hearing is the, the cost of shipping um, is going to be and is already going up for air, you know, land and sea shipping. Um, also couriers, you know, have being a, having a courier with a collection is often a common practice, but is that going to become common? Is it still going to be possible? What alternatives are we going to need to think of instead of that for tracking, for security? Um, and also for staging, when things are coming back or going out, what kind of staging areas do we need? How long do things need to sit um, to make sure that there's no active virus on them? Um, different procedures like that. So that's something that we're going to be talking about internally and certainly anything that we can develop and share out with the greater community, we certainly will. I think one of the confounding factors there is that a lot of our institutions, even though we're reopening, may be closed to visitors for some time. So we may be solely relying on um, shipping loans for researchers to get what they need. And um, if that's compromised because, you know, institutions aren't fully open on the other end or there are shipping issues, it, it may really stop research essentially. I think this is going to be one of the most painful things for collections people. We're already getting requests for people who just need a little information to finish a project. A student needs it to finish their dissertation. Uh, someone needs to just come to a new place. They're starting their project, but they can't get any material. And we're sort of powerless to help them the way that we're used to doing. And um, it's, 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 it's very painful. Now, already in ecology in 2020 is becoming known as the year of missing data. In, yeah. you know, all forms of, of long-term observations. Uh, so it, it's, uh, there's a lot that we're just gonna have to figure out how to adjust to in not having full access to everything that we would have wanted. Um, yeah, are we, are we going to have to take staff um, away from collections care and help them to do digitization that would help researchers or other projects to make um, specimen photos or CT scans or other data available so that researchers can finish their projects. And then with, I'm sorry, to, but just to, to continue with your thought, you know, continuing to digitize and things like that, which are great ideas. But one of the concerns that we've been discussing is where is that funding coming from? Where is that expertise yeah. coming from? Who's going to be reassigned or redirected in their efforts to focus on um, digitization when they may not have the expertise or the training on it. You know, how can we re-educate existing staff or bring on new staff with the skills that we need um, with the budget challenges that everyone is going to be facing going forward? Um, digitization is very important and it's something the Smithsonian has been working on um, for a number of years now, as many of us have, but it's, it's a major concern, especially with the budget concerns coming up. Well, and one of the concerns I have is with the move to digitization. In, in some cases, it's driven by generous grant funding, which is great. 
but then there hasn't been any long-term calculation of what I call digital depreciation. Nobody is paying attention to the long-term cost of having to set aside money to upgrade your systems and be able yeah. to migrate the data to new platforms. So you're basically building a large uh, cost hanging over you to maintain the digital infrastructure that I'm afraid many museums aren't budgeting for. So our next question from Deb Paul, do we need to assume that there are many other potential pathogens in our collections? Is there a place for universal precautions to be in place for certain collection types? I mean, at some level, the, the answer is yes. Our, our natural science collections are filled with pathogens um, because they came out of, out of nature. Um, but most of those are really not significant risks in normal, <clears throat> in normal use. Um, they may become risks if you, if you extract and concentrate them in, in some way in a research project. Um, so I'm not saying ignore them, but um, it's um, you know, like a soil sample. It's just filled with things. And a mammal, mammal fur is filled with all kinds of nasty microbes so um but it's but the risks are are negligible in most cases scott there's a question um about whether the realm project is also testing other ma material objects such as taxidermy specimens the uh for the realm project the, the final list of what will be tested hasn't been determined yet in part because we don't know how many tests can be afforded these tests are are, are not cheap in a you know doing doing multiple time samples in a, in a bsl3 laboratory um we hope that the project can actually get into some kinds of, of natural history specimens, but it will also be guided by sort of the iterative process of, you know, what are the results from each level of testing and then looking for sort of the extremes to calibrate um, wh what we should be worried about and, and, and what we shouldn't. And as I say, there's a whole lot of, of uh, unknowns there yet. Yeah. Another question for you, Scott. Um, did you say that the current study of SARS-CoV-2 virus on various library surfaces is focused on detectability, but not necessarily infectability? Are you aware, uh, aware of any studies that are looking into the latter? Uh, detectability, but not necessarily infectability. Yes, we're not looking, uh, the Realm Project is not looking at the question of sort of what is the dosage of uh, virus particles that is necessary to infect a, a human. And there are certainly those kinds of studies going on in the biomedical community. I, I can't point to any at the moment, but um, it's, um, it, you know, again, working with the virus is, is challenging methodologically and you, you can't control for the dosage as you would be able to if you were working with say bacteria or, or, or fungus in, in the, and the test protocols that the tell is using. Richard Witte asks, if as predicted that closures may become more regular yearly or so, any thoughts of how to manage museums if closures do occur more often to keep things rolling and safe? Well, just a comment for overall museum management and finance. I, I'm hoping more museums will start building up a larger financial reserve um, in the bank to be able to cover their monthly operating costs, including salary. One of the reasons I, I threw out a figure um, early on that we were worried that up to a third of museums might be at risk of closure during this pandemic. Part of that's due to information we have about how, off, how many museums have to dip into their operating reserves to cover operating expenses in any given year anyway best practice is to have three months of operating expenses on hand to be able to cover emergencies. And we don't have an exact number for that, but just informally from knowing the finances and financial statements of many museums, that's not a very common practice in, in museums writ large. So I am hoping museums are starting to rewrite their financial procedures to build up a larger bankroll to be able to cover unscheduled closures like this and not have to face repeated furloughs or layoffs. One of the other kind of opportunities, at least in the longer term, and especially when you're renovating or, or building new facilities, is designing the sort of so-called collections preservation environment in a way that it is stable in the long term. 
And you know, that can be individual things like using you know, liquid nitrogen instead of mechanical freezers. It can be at a, at a scale of a, the construction of a, of a building. And I'll, I'll add to the chat here, there was a, a Smithsonian did a workshop on this four or so years ago where we sort of looked at the state of the art at that time of, of um, uh, relative humidity, temperature, um, green building issues, sustainability, and um, the proceedings of that are available online as a free PDF. So that's, that's one, and there's been certainly some things since then, but at least as a collection that represents the, the body of knowledge at one particular time, it's useful. Mel Murray says, rethinking hands-on is such a difficult prospect for a hands-on visitor experience. I would be very interested in some creative ideas. The Australian Museum prides itself on our accessibility to specimens in public areas. And I'll note that Deb Paul um, says, I wonder if it brings up the need for a virtual um, experience development. Okay, well, I'll put my futurist hat on just for a minute and geek out about technology. First of all, on the low tech end, not talking about biological collections, but we're seeing some museums pivot to hands on activities where they're preparing to give packets of material to parents that they can keep and take home because people feel safe having something packaged for them, given to them, that they're not going to be like sharing pencils or handling a specimen that gets given back. I don't know to what extent that can be transitioned to biological hands-on material, but it's an approach some museums are using. In the long term, haptic technology is really beginning to develop. So maybe there's gonna be more opportunity to have virtual hands-on in the future where people can feel like they're touching things when they're not actually transmitting germs. But one of the things that we do need to consider are the people out there with challenges that rely on touch to experience. Um, their environment. So that's one of the things that uh, we have a group called Promoting Exhibit and Security Access, um, Access and Security in Collections, the P's. Uh, we're a collaborative group with the National Gallery of Art and some other local museums within the DC area talking about, you know, using this as an opportunity to talk about the visitor experience. How can we better educate our people before they even get into the museum, what can we do for outreach while they're waiting in queues, you know, thinking about when you go to a large entertainment venue that has, you know, screens and things while people are going in or interactives or people going out and doing outreach to educate them about how to have a positive experience in the museum or facility without, you know, damaging collections with, you know, having proper respect and, and also um, to find out what our public needs for learning in a new way um, and doing outreach with them for those different activities and especially for the people that do have the challenges of coming into our facilities and needing that interaction um, and that physical touch. I know that some folks are already installing styluses or having styluses yeah. as a giveaway at some of their institutions so that they yeah. can still use their touch screen capabilities yeah. that they have spent a lot of funding on already and is already installed. But there's also folks that are talking about they had been having um, touch screens as part of a new exhibit they were putting in and now they're starting to reverse their plans for that new exhibit um, and thinking about how to approach it differently. The other thing is I've seen a thread, uh, this was in art museums, but I think it's, uh, it could be transitioned to natural history material as well. Museums that were already using 3D printing to create touchable models for people with visual impairments so that they could have some tactile interaction with exhibits are talking about, well, we just ramp up from having one set that we shared, you know, can we ramp up to the point where we can simply give them away so that people aren't worried about sanitation and, and sharing of 3D models so they can have the touch experience. Um, we have a question if whether there are any cross museum working groups that are having conversations about using educational collection specimens in the COVID and post COVID era. Um, I will just make a plug here for EDCOM, which is the education committee um, professional network within AAM. So um, any individual member of AAM can join any of the professional networks. And I know that EDCOM is talking actively about that issue. We have a comment question directed at Tom. I've read that 
Even very low heat for fairly short time renders virus non-viable. For example, like baking your mail. If that's true, is that a possibility for education hands-on materials like minerals, fossils, bones? Yeah, um, there, there is evidence for in the coronavirus research. Um, nothing that I've seen on this particular one, but given that it's a similar structure with membranes, um, the, all the temperature tests are done for hospital procedures. So refrigeration at four, 20 degrees to 23 or so room temperature, uh, body temperature, and then a few higher temperatures for particular kinds of uh, tests that need to have deactivated virus or what have you. And there's a little bit, a little bit of work at 70. So at the sort of 60 to 70, it, numbers have been like, uh, because they picked the test conditions 30 minutes or so, it, um, if I look back in the note, it's sort of up, up there in 60 degree range. It shows deactivation. Now, um, the, uh, so there's a potential that's there. The, the issue will be to develop, you know, test that protocol and like Scott's doing with the group, you know, the very necessary evidentiary value that you're reducing, not only just doing a, um, a uh, log tighter reduction, but actually getting it down to the point where uh, we have an estimation of safety for, for handling uh, is, is the critical aspect. And, and so this is why we were being very cautionary in our, our approach out of the CCI to try and uh, stop people from sort of, you know, in terms of even at room temperature, thinking of that there's a hard boundary because we need to, we need to know a little, little better what's going on. Um, but yes, there is a potential there. And uh, so it, it, would, it could be, it could be developed. There's a comment from Ben Norton. The staff reassignment process has significant advantages in the current circumstances, but there are inherent limits. The reassignment staff were hired to do different job. We can give them other things to do, but that will run out eventually. For, for sure it will. Um, but I think what it, what it speaks to is thinking about cross-training in the future. Uh, with yeah. the idea that we may be facing times, well, first of all, we may, when we do go back, we probably won't go all back at once. People will still work from home for a portion of their time. So we need to rethink jobs so that there's a portion of everyone's job that can be done remotely. And if it requires additional training, then that's what we need to focus on providing. Well, the other benefit of cross-training and doing it regularly anyway is it also helps provide diversity and equity in hiring because Absolutely. if you're doing broader training that provides avenues for people to apply for and advance through parallel career tracks that they weren't necessarily hired for. Yes, absolutely. So we have one last question. We're, we're nearing 10 o'clock, so, or whatever time it may be in your time zone. Um, <laughs> Dirk Newman says the long-term risks, especially for college or university-based museums is not a new situation and COVID-19 rather seems to be an accelerant to conveniently justify the cuts. The global biodiversity crisis and the required taxonomic input needed for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework to understand biodiversity on earth would give us the opportunity to develop a strategy to demonstrate the relevancy and to increase the vis visibility of our research. How could we get this started? What and who would be needed to address the challenges and to develop suited strategies so that political decision makers better understand the relevance of our work? Leaving you with an easy question. <laughs> we would all like to have the answer to that question. I will say um, I've been part of a lot of groups that are working on the Nagoya Protocol, and I highly, highly recommend that more um, collections, people, and institutions get involved in these discussions um, through their governments. Often the U.S. recently had a webinar, and there's opportunities to make comments on how important um, for example, digital sequence information is to all of us doing research, um, but I'd, I'd like to hear what the other panelists think. Well, I'll just I totally general... agree on the importance of the scientific community reaching out to their governments with regard to uh, things like the Nagoya Protocol, um, which you know, is, is certainly a, a huge, um, well, there's a lot of issues, but it, it certainly has the, the possibility of bringing a lot of international collaboration in research um, 
to a, to a stop, sort of a reverse of what it was intended to do, but that's what we're seeing. Well, I think it's been obvious from my remarks. I'm speaking from a U.S. perspective, and I'm open about that because that's the system I'm most conversant in. But I think in the U.S., one of the things we really need is for associations like SPNHC and um, ICOM NatHist and AIBS to work on advocacy briefs that can be used by any organization, either internally with their management or at the state or federal level for funding. And not in response to a crisis, but ongoing and updated so that we have this body of literature saying, here's, here's the argument for why this is important. And we're not dependent on, you know, the occasional uh, journalist calling and asking for an anecdote about how research collections are useful and we trot out the same three examples. AAM does this on issues of, uh, that are important to museums of all types. So we're continually developing advocacy briefs about the benefit of museums writ large to society. And I think uh, any specific dis discipline like biological research collections needs to be creating the sub briefs so that people can take that ammunition and need it uh, or deploy it as needed. So I guess with that, we will end. Um, thank you again to our panelists who were so generous and putting together presentations in the uh, short time span and willing to answer all of your questions. I hope um, everyone out there in Zoom and uh, YouTube land enjoyed it and we hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you so much. <laughs>